Uh, first, your reaction to this Brexit subcommittee that met yesterday and this argument they've made now for what looks like voluntary alignment with EU rules and regulations. The problem with the, with the, the Chequers discussion is that it, it, it hasn't essentially resolved anything. They're still stuck with the same dilemma and the same division. And that is, do you try and stay close to Europe, in which case you're going to have to abide by Europe's rules and regulations, in which case you haven't taken back control, actually you've lost the, the control you had by being in the decision-making room, or alternatively, do you go, as some members of the Cabinet want, for a much cleaner break with divergence of rules and regulations, in which case the economic dislocation for the country is going to be great. And they haven't, they've resolved to be unified, but they haven't actually decided which one of those two positions they want, and therefore they keep coming out with a sort of amalgam of the two that is a kind of cake and eat it scenario that A, I don't think works technically, but B, I don't think the European Union will agree to. On the face of it though, essentially what both sides agree on is that we could align ourselves with the rules and regulations of the EU where it suits Britain. I mean, what's not to like about that? Yeah, absolutely. But if we align ourselves with Europe's rules and regulations, be under no doubt at all what that means. That means Europe is going to lay down the rules and regulations. We'll have left the room where these rules are made, so we'll have literally given up our power to influence things. Although we only align ourselves with the ones we agree with, presumably, under this government plan. Right, but insofar as we do, then we'll have to abide by their rules. Insofar as we don't, then the economic cost is going to be much greater. And that's the dilemma, because for over four decades, Britain's been building up this, these trading relationships. We now have over half our trade. I mean, if you take the financial service sector, you know, we've, we've got a predominant position in Europe as a result of access to the single market. Now, if you want into that market, you're going to abide by those rules. On the other hand, if you don't abide by those rules and you're out of that market, well, there's going to be a big cost in jobs and investment and long term, I think, you know, a, a serious problem for our position in the financial sector. And, you know, we, we've got a surplus of something like £90 billion in the, in the service sector. If you put that at risk, you're going to suffer in terms of growth, jobs, investment and living standards. In some ways, what was more significant yesterday than the sort of cabinet fudge was Labour seemingly moving its position on a customs union. Jeremy Corbyn, we understand, will make a speech on Monday about all of this. I mean, what, in an ideal world, would you like to hear Jeremy Corbyn say on Monday about Labour's position? Well, if he moves to a customs union, which will give us at least some possibility of protecting um, the Northern Ireland situation, because you, you can have a much, not maybe a friction-free, but a much more frictionless divide between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland, if he does that, you know, I'll, I'll welcome it. But of course, you know, again, you get dilemmas with this too. If you, if you are in a customs union with the European Union, you're going to find it difficult to strike free trade deals with other countries because you'll have bound yourself in to trading arrangements and your external tariff with the European Union. So this is why, you know, the point that I'm making in the, the paper we put out today is when you analyse it, this is what we've learned. Brexit does not mean any one form of Brexit. There are at least two different versions of Brexit in Cabinet, four within Parliament, and it's not clear which one the public really means. And that's why I think there's got to be much more debate before we settle on a version of Brexit. And then my view is if Parliament can't agree on that version, which I think is a real possibility, then the people should have the final say on it. Because you may well be, have people who voted to leave but if, for example, the Brexit deal the government offers is one in which we're still going to be aligned with Europe's rules and regulations in significant areas, they may say, well, in that case, why are we leaving? Isn't there a fairly clear mandate, though, for, for the, roughly the sort of Brexit that we want? Because there was a general election where both parties ran on a platform of withdrawing from the customs union and the single market. So we know roughly that's what we're headed for. I, you know, I take your point about alignment, but generally speaking, those who argue for staying in a customs union that looks like the customs union are sort of twisting the mandate a little bit, aren't they? Well, but this is the very point. I mean, you will get people who have voted leave, by the way, who say, look, I voted leave to get out of the politics of the European Union but I want a relationship like Norway or Switzerland. Okay, but that's completely different from what Boris Johnson and Rhys Mogg and these people are arguing for, which is a clean break, and then a, 
you know, a readjustment and a, a redrawing, a redesigning of the country's economic future. One is a relatively small change economically, big change politically, small change economically. The other is a dramatic change economically. So my point is, it's quite hard to interpret this mandate when it's obvious even from within cabinet, there's a wide disparity in the views about what type of Brexit is there. So this is why, you know, I say that the Brexit, the referendum was a mandate for leaving if leaving was that simple. But it's turned out it's not. It's highly complex with different forms of Brexit. And in the end, there's got to be at least another form of decision making, either in Parliament or an election in a referendum in order to work out what people really want. So how do you see that playing out then? You have a general election on the basis of the deal or a referendum on the basis of the deal that, the, that Theresa May puts forward? Yeah, look, I think the first thing is it will come to Parliament, whatever deal they have. Although I think it's going to be really difficult for them to resolve this dilemma, but let's, let's assume they do. But I think they will find that it's going to be hard for that deal to command a majority in Parliament. You know, I may be wrong and they may get one that satisfies everyone. But if they don't, and there's an impasse, then I think even the Conservative Party may understand that the sensible thing in those circumstances is to realise there isn't agreement um, about what Brexit really means. And you need to be able to go back and say to people, OK, here's the deal the government wants. Here's what we have in the EU today. You know, which do you prefer? But then what do you do if people say we don't like the deal? Do you offer them a new deal? I mean, the referendums could go on and on and on. Well, I think the referendum this one will be completely different because the last referendum was a referendum did you like the European Union or not okay we decided we didn't we wanted to leave this one's a this one's a realistic choice here we know what we have we know what we're getting what do we do now once if the country says look actually you know we are so committed to Brexit that whatever difficulties we have with the government position we actually prefer to leave then you know, people like myself have got to accept that's it, that's you know, the game over, you've got to get and make the best of a new future. Um, but if they don't vote in that way, then I think it's pretty clear there isn't a majority for any one form of Brexit. And actually, the Leave vote accumulated a coalition of people who had very different interests in, in voting Leave. And once you actually come with a specific proposition, there's no agreement. There's no agreement, though, on the form of Brexit. Is it really fair then to say, right, no Brexit whatsoever? That feels like a betrayal, doesn't it, of the 52%? Well, that's a good question. I think one of the issues will be, um, you know, is it possible, do, do you end up even with, with options? Now, I know people say, well, that's very complicated. But my response to that is, I'm afraid the situation is very complicated. But, but you're going to have to, you, if you can't make an agreement in Parliament, because there literally is just not consent, for whatever of these versions of Brexit you want, then I think you've got to find some way of bringing it back so that people can have a final say on the final deal. Coming back to what we're currently facing in Parliament at the moment, there's this amendment to, to the Trade Bill. I'm sure you don't miss these intricacies of Parliament, but do you think Labour should back this Conservative amendment to essentially bind the Prime Minister into a customs union? Of course, we, we definitely should. What would be bizarre, frankly, is if we ourselves said there should be some form of customs union but didn't back it. And I think this is an issue in which members of parliament, you know, who are studying this stuff the whole time, I mean, you know, we're all, we all, I mean, one of the things that's really weird about this whole situation is all of us, even me, I was prime minister for 10 years, know infinitely more about single markets, customs unions, free trade agreements, you know, because we're all studying it and we never had to study it before, but now we study it, we're seeing all the different things. I think people have got to make up their minds on the basis, not of party affiliation, but what they actually think is in the interest of the country. I should ask you about Northern Ireland as well, because of course that was a key part of your premiership, uh, brokering the Good Friday Agreement. Do you think that peace in Northern Ireland is sustainable outside of a customs union? I think if you went out with a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, you are undermining one of the fundamental principles of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, that agreement was based on Northern Ireland staying part of the UK but keeping the open border between North and South because always the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland have either been outside of the European Union or they both joined on the same day together inside the European Union. Once the Republic's in the European Union, the UK's outside of the European Union, if you put a hard border, you're going to cause real disruption 
to that process of peace. Now, you know, I'm not saying it will it will um, destroy the peace agreement. I, mean, I desperately hope that's not true if it comes to that. But you, it's it's irresponsible some of the talk, frankly, that's happening at the moment. Oh, the Good Friday Agreement isn't isn't really worth having. Look, those of us who who were brought up during the era of the Troubles know it's worth having. For 20 years, an issue that was omnipresent in our national life, namely the Northern Ireland Troubles, has been largely absent for the last 20 years. It didn't happen by chance. Can you believe that there are MPs, including some Labour MPs, Kate Hoey, for example, arguing that the Good Friday Agreement needs to be not necessarily torn up, but reformed? I, I find it, because they're all Brexiteers who are saying this, I find it irresponsible I mean, deeply disappointing, I mean, sickening, actually, that people should really want to play around with, with that agreement. I mean, it was agony to get it. It was agony to implement it. It's been very difficult all the way through, but it's still worth having, for sure, because the alternative we know. I mean, it's not, it's not that we haven't seen what the alternative is. And, you know, for them to want to sacrifice even that peace agreement in Northern Ireland on the altar of Brexit, I, I find unbelievable. Just a couple more. One last one on Brexit. Um, do you feel, given what looks to be happening with Labour Party's position now on Brexit, do you feel as if for the first time Labour is almost on the cusp of offering something radically different when it comes to the vision of Brexit? Yes, I hope so. I mean, I think the Labour Party's position is definitely evolving. I welcome that. And it's because the Labour Party, in one sense, is free of this kind of ideological schism that there is in the Conservative Party. I mean, the Conservative Party's division on Europe is really deep and the referendum was meant to cure that division and it's just it's just given it fresh life actually and, and 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 put its roots even deeper so the Labour Party frankly is not really divided on Europe the vast majority of Labour Party members are in favor of a constructive relationship with Europe so I think this is the Labour Party moving to a different position and I think the real question will be is the Conservative Party or at least certain elements of it prepared to 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 join in alliance in, in the interests of the, of the country.